Boom, we're recording. Okay, Nerd Talk, August 18th, guest Felix Erla. Uh, three, two, one. Hello, wonderful beings. Welcome to another episode of Nerd Talk. My guest today is a foot nerd from Germany and someone who I've become pretty close friends with over the past year or so. His name is Felix Erla. And today we're going to share our stories about our recent fasting experience. So Felix, thanks for being available to chat on the podcast and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> a real pleasure to be a part of it. And nice. yeah, look, looking forward to the conversation. Cool. Well, it, it's always a treat to have someone on the podcast that I speak to frequently. You know, we talk twice, once or twice a week. And, uh, you know, someone who you've already got a familiar rapport with, these conversations tend to be a little bit uh, smoother and more real. So, yeah, I'm really excited. And for those who um, don't know who Felix is, because this is your first time uh, being introduced to the uh, Audio Project community, let's start by letting people know who Felix is, you know, your purpose, what you love, um, and then we can maybe get into how our paths crossed. So let's start with just you introducing yourself. Yeah, so my name is Felix. Uh, I'm from Germany, Rudolstadt, just a small city in the very center of Germany. Beautiful here. And yeah, I'm just a regular human um, who loves to be a father um, of two soon to be three kids. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a husband to a beautiful wife. Uh, she's supporting me with every action that I do. Uh, even it's not a conventional way. Um, so I appreciate it a lot. <laughs> shout out to and, Natalie. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Natalie. And yeah, my purpose is just detecting my weaknesses and um, yeah, turning them into meaning um, to, you know, get a clearer picture of my life and where my life will take me. Pretty much. Amazing. That was a great intro. And I think. One of the things I've always loved in, you know, in Costa Rica, for example, people would ask, you know, what do you do? Um, and I think most people are expecting the answer of what do you do for work? What is your occupation? And yep. I loved how instantly you're just like, I'm a father. And then you just kind of like, let that sit with them. And, <laughs> and they're almost like, okay, well, what else? It's like, that is my, that is my purpose. That is what yeah. I love. The other stuff is actually secondary to my main job, which is being a father to my two kids. Um, and I think that's uh, just a very powerful statement because, you know, I ask what, what do you do or what um, gets you out of bed in the morning to a lot of people when we do these episodes. And several of them have said, my kids give me purpose, but a lot of them will, will instantly jump to what they do for work. Um, mm. But I, I've always kind of loved that. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I did stuff uh, for, for work, but it never um, defined me. Mm -hmm. defined myself and you know i did apprenticeship for lifeguard and i studied biology and and different stuff but it was never me and i came to the conclusion that the first thing that was the real me from inside out was uh, being a father and it's my biggest profession and the you know i just found the beauty in the duty um you know we are conditioned to have a duty uh, the duty of doing something after school mm -hmm. for job for work and um, yeah I just found the main purpose in life and the natural duties that nature is offering to us and it's having kids you know engaging with um, you know a beautiful other human that you decide to live your whole life with and yeah so that's the thing or the things that define myself and I find purpose in telling it a profession when people, um, you know, tend to say something about their work mm -hmm. and it is work. You know, I had um, just a happening two days ago uh, when I was in the, in the forest with the guys. So with my two little boys um, and there came two ladies and they, they said, uh, oh, it's quite a bit of work, right? And I was like, mm, not really um, being a father. <laughs> being a father is like the, the magnificence that you can see in work. You know, sure, it is work, but it's not a chore. So 
being a father, I just told them being a father is like the most beautiful thing nature can offer to you. And yeah, I just appreciate it. And it's just a beautiful duty. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people, you know, whenever you use a word, um, you're often defining that word based on your definition, right? And so if someone um, doesn't like what they do for quote unquote work, right? If their definition of work is something you're doing to make money to pay your bills versus something that you're an action you're doing that you feel a duty towards, those are very different, 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 different definitions of work, right? And I think a human without work um, is, I don't think that's a very fulfilling life, right? So whether you call it a duty or work, uh, I think we all need something that we can actively struggle with and actively work on and feel alignment with. So it's like, I do this because I love to do it, not just because I need to make money by doing it. Yeah. That, that definition of work still applies. Being a father is work, but it's not work in the common definition of something I dread doing. It's something I love doing and I want to do and gives me uh, like this deep sense of, of purpose that there's two living beings that are growing up and I'm shaping how they see the world and I'm helping to keep them alive, safe, healthy. Um, and it's probably just something that you learn to enjoy the process. Cause I, even the videos that you post with your two little guys, like, and my brother just had a kid and I just, I literally, I look like a weirdo. Cause I just observe him for like five or 10 minutes. I'll just stare at him and see, and I just see all the cogs going in his brain as he's learning things for the first time, as he's doing a movement that he's never done before. And it's like, you see his eyes light up and it's like, Oh my God, that, that is such an intelligent, amazing creature. That's, it's like the most advanced thing I've ever seen in my life. It's just a baby discovering movement or discovering things for the first time. And it's so, it's so cool. It really is. Yeah, because sometimes you, you catch the moment that you share something for the first time together. Right. Um, you know, when you live consciously with a kid, you can explore the missing links that you um, maybe didn't experience very consciously. Mm -hmm. And then you can um, implement the missing pictures in your own life. You know, right. so kids can't be just work because they, they teach you something and they are a source of um, learning, you know. Right. And I mean, work is, we are just like the first society that has a word for work. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just life. You know, it used to be just life. And um, so work is a very abstract thing that we just developed right. and invented. So, yeah. And oftentimes it's just language, going back to the roots. Yeah. And language is very limiting. It's like you pick a word for something that has a massive meaning. And then all of a sudden that word creates a box that that's all you can define with that word. When mm -hmm. in reality, every person's definition is going to be different. And also someone's definition might be much broader than that box that most people look at that word uh, to mean. So, um, yeah, very interesting. And I think one of the things <clears throat> that I look forward to reading about is in future, if you decide to do, to share some of your parenting journeys, because I think, you know, my brother and his wife are, are just had a child and she's trying to learn everything she can because she's starting to realize, and it's very interesting to chat with her about it, that we always have a tendency to parent our kids based on how we were raised or based on the pressures of how our parents are telling us how to do things. And this is all well-intentioned, right? Like your parents telling you how to do something with your kid um, is well-intentioned. They're trying to give you what they think is good advice. Problem is, is if we now have access to better information of how to raise kids, like you said, unconventionally, because we have a rationale for why we're doing that, um, it creates a bit of friction, right? Where your parents are like, why are you doing that? Should you be doing that? because they don't understand the backstory of why you feel that that's a pro an appropriate thing. So, um, you know, have you felt that with, uh, with how you're bringing up Milo and Yona or, or have you felt that friction between generational parenting advice and what you're, what you're doing? Um, yeah, I did. But, um, you know, with, with the birth of our kids, we really had the intention to not do it differently, but to do it, on our own way and there were you know um, these expectations 
that you hear from the outside world on how you have to raise um, a kid and mm -hmm. how parenting has to work. And I mean, there are a lot of um, books, you know, guides to the perfect parenting, this or that approach. And, you know, what I just realized is that parenting, parenting is a very individual seed um, that grows right, right into the bomb of the mother and flourishes, you know, after birth. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what kind of flower it is. You know, when you buy a guide or do the conventional way, you have maybe, oh, this is the guide uh, to a beautiful rose. And people try to deconstruct and reconstruct this rose. Mm -hmm. But, you know, parenting is a very individual approach. And because different individuals come together and um, you don't have to invent it, you just have to explore it, you know? Parenting is just being open-minded to any kind of situation that appears. It has, you have to be in the present moment. You don't have to think about tomorrow. You don't have to think about yesterday because maybe you learned something and you will learn something. So it's just let, let the seed grow, you know? Don't have any expectations because you will do it differently and it's okay to do it differently. Um, just, you know, listen to your heart. Um, the genetic code, I would say, is just love, you know, for a good approach of parenting. And the mother has her role, the father has his role, and when they come together, it's so individual. You know, the mother is like the water source, you know, for the seed, the, the medicine, and the father is like the son, you know, protecting his coming and going you know the father is there to protect the family and to um to make sure um the family stays alive you know what we could um, call work so mm -hmm. the father has to go to work but he's always coming back so he creates this the safe space and the protection you know just like the son she's always coming back and because we depend on her you know and the mother has to be with the family all the time. Right. You know, just like water. We need water on a frequent base, um, frequent level. And um, yeah, that's just the approach that, that I um, explored and realized for, for, for my family. You know, just let the seed grow and um, yeah, be open, you know, learn. And don't follow um, any guide pretty right. much. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great analogy because I think uh, I read a book called The Carpenter and the Gardener, and they, they essentially contrast two approaches to parenting. Um, and I think that that analogy can be applied to a lot of things, like even how we view our body. You know, the carpenter is very structured and thinks there's a certain way things need to be done and tries to, tries to essentially um, engineer every element of it, right? Like, your kids can do this. They can't do this. This is how things should be done. It's very specific. You have a blueprint and you have to execute that blueprint. Whereas the gardener doesn't actually try and tell, um, you know, the gardener style of parenting doesn't tell the kid how to grow up. It literally just makes sure that everything is provided, all the nutrients you prov you make sure there's sunlight, there's soil and there's water. And then the plant knows how to grow without really having to be told how to grow. And I think that that approach to parenting is something that, uh, we've sort of lost touch with because absolutely because absolutely. we're we're essentially programmed to be carpenters, right? Like our families yeah. program us to say, no, things have to be done like this. This is what they should eat. This is when they should eat it. And the medical community takes a very carpenter approach to how they um, essentially consult on parenting. When in reality, like you said, it's like no expectations. Be present. Give your kid love, and just see how, how the, how the flower blossoms and, and don't yeah. have any expectations of how it should be a certain way. Um, just sort of learn. And, um, and there is an element of just not knowing, right? Like you have to just feel comfortable that you're not going to know everything. There's going to be times where you're like, shit, I don't know what to do here, but that's sort of part <laughs> of it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, it's just all within us. And like you said, we just lost the touch. And I mean, maybe a good 
point is that you have um, to restore the environment because we pretty much built this environment where you could depend on a guide. And I mean, just a pretty basic example is the stool where the kids are in, you know, this chair. Mm -hmm. um, when they sit on a high table, you know, there's all the risks that the kids can fall down. And so when you read the guide, put the kids in a free four belt system into <laughs> this high chair so they, they don't fall down. And, you know, so maybe you have to make some steps back, you know, uh, create an environment where you can um, get to a point to trust yourself, you know, with the flat tables. Um, you don't depend on any chairs. Mm -hmm. So there is one point where you can trust your gut that your kid will be safe uh, when it stands on this flat table. Right. You know, and so, yeah, just recreate the environment, um, educate yourself, what is necessary, what is not really necessary in this world. And yeah, it's just the simplicity. And when you detect the simplicity, um, you are maybe more open to a concept like this of just let the seed grow. You yeah. know, it's a little bit of a mindset, mindset shift that you and have I, to do in prior. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, you know, one of the, uh, you know, we'll talk about beam tribe uh, a little bit later, but one of the beam tribe credo elements is openness. And I think that is such yeah. a fitting, um, sort of principle because you really do have to be open-minded, right? You have to be open-minded and accept that the way things you've done things, or you've heard other people do things might not be the optimal way. And I think it's comfortable and easy to do things the way they've been done, right? There's, if you live on the floor and you don't have chairs, you're going to take a lot less shit from people that visit or your family giving you crap about like, why don't you have chairs? Um, but if it allows you to live a more natural lifestyle, and allows your kids to expose their bodies to what they should be exposed to, right? What they would be exposed to in a natural world. Um, you have to feel a strong purpose towards that, but you also have to be open-minded to try things and try things that maybe don't work and then change your mind. And I think many people are very rigid in their thinking. Um, and I think that limits people. And sometimes I sense a, almost a bit of dissonance where parents will do something because they think that's the way it should be done but they don't intuitively feel that that aligns with sort of a natural way of living, but they're not, they, they don't have a sense of, uh, you know, confidence to be able to experiment. And I think if yeah. people just felt more comfortable and empowered uh, experimenting and, you know, I think this whole thing of having some of the content that we put in the app about parenting gives people a template for how parenting can be different. Right. Like when we when we did that podcast with Tony Riddle in London, it really yeah. opened my oh, eyes. Cool. He talked about how like they'll have a table on the ground and Tallulah, one of his young daughters, will just climb on the table and go in a squat and eat standing on the table. And most families will say, get off the table. You, can, you know, like it's or they wouldn't even be on the table because they'd be strapped into their five point harness in their high chair. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, but it just shows you that like kids just do what's natural. She didn't know you're not supposed to go on a table because she's never been told you're not allowed to go on a table. And she and doesn't did, even know that it's a table. She doesn't even know it's a table. It's just another surface <laughs> in yeah, the house to be explored. Surface. Like I remember my brother's kid, uh, we have dinner on Sundays at my dad's house every week. And he, climbed, he wiggled out of his high chair and stood on it and was doing squats and was dancing around. And everyone at the deal was just laughing. I was like, this is so, he's so proud that he's standing on top of the tray instead yeah, of exactly. sitting in the chair. And he's like, yeah. he just wants to play. He doesn't want to be strapped into a freaking like no, they won't. harness. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, bit of a won't. bit of a tangent, but um, I think, you know, I'd love to just ask you a bunch of questions about parenting on a future podcast because I think a lot of people that listen to this have kids and would probably be curious. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll pick up, we'll pick that tangent up another time, but maybe let's, uh, I would love to kind of go through your journey because now you're, you're pretty involved with TFC now. Um, mm. And I'm super grateful that our paths crossed in life, but let's tell, yeah, like too, a, let's tell a brief story of like how, when was the first time you came across TFC? And let's give the Coles notes of how that's evolved until right now. Because we've, 
you know, I don't even know how long ago that was, but we've done a lot of, we, you know, we did a trip to London. We went to Prague. We've been to Costa Rica. Like I was thinking about this last night. I was like, holy shit. I, I spent yeah, more, I like spent more time with you than my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk yeah. about the story. It feels quite long, you know, but um, I just looked back and it was in September 2018 that I purchased um, these two beams for me and my father. Right. And yeah, so it must be, must have been in in 2018 somewhere, maybe I would say six months before the purchase of the beam, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I came across TFC. It was on Instagram, I think, um, you know, just scrolled through the feed and, um, yeah, checked out the Instagram profile and I liked it (laughs) (laughs) and followed. So yeah. And at that time, what made you want to get, what made you want to get into beams? What attracted you to balance beams? Because it's a pretty, you know, to get two of the biggest beams that we sell, um ship to germany is not it's an expensive endeavor right like uh, yeah, to yeah ship these things and so what made you gravitate towards that what what made you want to buy a beam basically yeah it was it's weird to explain because it was really a gut feeling um that made me want this specific beam that is coming from Canada all the way to Germany with shipping costs over 100 bucks. <laughs> right. But, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who believes in products that come with um, a certain attitude or um, just meaning. And mm-hmm. although I just uh, know you guys from, from, from Instagram, I, I don't know. It's weird to explain. It's weird to explain. I mean, um, you know, it has a little bit, yeah, it relates to the whole story of my life pretty much. Um, you know, I had this knee pain that opened me into the, the, the barefoot world and, you know, movement. Um, I always try to, um, to bulk and shred, uh, the day, the years before, you know, mm-hmm. to achieve a certain level of health um, with all the issues that I just had, and just the, the knee pain, um, yeah, just pulled the trigger t- for me to okay, I have to, I have to get back on track with you know self responsibility. I don't want any surgeries, and um, you know the barefoot thing um, just sounded very familiar Mm -hmm. on on any type of yeah whatever it just sounded logical and um i think i was on the barefoot journey for one and a half years to this point uh maybe where i met uh, the tfc stuff and yeah so i went through yoga and body balance and flexibility and all this kind of stuff and the balance beam just opened a new space for me um, to explore my body and so i was really attracted to just the fact of balancing um you know and in 2018 i didn't have the confidence to get outside uh, on the on the urban beam and to test out my abilities nice. <laughs> so i wanted to create a safe space at home uh, with this beam you know i I didn't have the time or, you know, just uh, the, the, the mental space to um, take care of engineering my own. So, yeah, I just took the opportunity, purchased these beams um, for my health and the health of my, uh, my father mm-hmm. because he had uh, hip, is- hip issues and knee issues and spine issues and everything. So, yeah, it was in 2018. So, cool. yeah. So it started there and then we kind of kept uh in touch you know infrequently with with emails i think i you know we kind (laughs) of chatted back and forth (laughs) but funny story uh (laughs) you know we chatted before on instagram because i was i mean i can say it loud i was pretty lonely um with the mindset that just opened to me you know that i didn't fully explore uh at this point but I knew it was the right direction to go, you know, mm-hmm. 
barefoot, weird movement, all this kind of stuff. And, right. um, you know, the natural health approach just, and so when you scroll through Instagram and you see funny memes, um, or something that reminds you of being barefoot is the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't, you can't share it with any person in your close environment. <laughs> right. You have to find an exhaust, you know, so yes. an exhaustion point. And so I just started to chat uh, with the foot collective on, on Instagram, just sending stuff here and there. And you replied and we, I don't know, it was the first uh, time we connected. And yeah, so it later turned out uh, an email chatting. I mean, it was in, in a bond with the FNP. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you have a question with the FNP and um yeah, that's when the email conversation just started with yeah, the so, Footner program. Yeah, with the Footner program, because I remember when you joined the Footner program, actually, you had kind of mentioned that you were going through uh, almost like a decision phase of like, do I uh, pursue or continue to pursue rather um, like a formal university education or, uh, yeah. or do I look at this alternative sort of community? And I can definitely relate to this thing of in the earlier days you're the crazy barefoot person where people are mm. like yeah that's that's not for me that's that's people that walk around barefoot these hippies that are balancing on beams they're weird and you so you have to find the others you have to find the other people yeah. who relate to you and and i think you know there's a lot of things that i think are problematic with the way social media has gone but there's also a lot of things that are amazing for example the entire foot nerd program and foot nerd community uh, wouldn't exist, I don't think, if it wasn't for Instagram, right? We wouldn't yeah. have connected if it wasn't for Instagram. So absolutely, there's this thing where your access to finding the other humans that think alike to what you think like and share some values, um, you're not limited to your local community anymore. You have access to the entire world. And that's, that's insane. I still look at that and I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy that we're even having this conversation right now. You live in Germany. Yeah, I live in Canada. We've met up in Costa Rica. We've met up in Prague. Like it's really, it's really cool. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's like any tool, right? Instagram is as good as you understand how to use it and as good as you understand the dangers of it. Right. And people always say, well, there's no danger to social media. It's like, well, mm. I think the reality would, you know, people who say that are often the people who don't even know the dangers that they're, <laughs> That yeah. they're submitting themselves to. <laughs> um, so yeah, with the Footner program, you know, maybe um, share sort of what made you gravitate towards it and sort of the decision that you were making at the point where you decided to commit to the Footner program. Yeah. So the Footner program was a way to get into um, self-made education, mm -hmm. uh, to educate myself about... Um, you know, foot health um, and overall health. Um, you know, I, I didn't um, have the connection to sources, you know, where I can um, just search for the topics that I need to get along. And the Footnote program was just something that I was attracted to, um, to, you know, maybe to explore the working side of this just of the of the ways that i explored for myself mm -hmm. so maybe it was a little bit of intention to okay i have to get on an alternative way to make money okay mm -hmm. in the future and this was like the first step to um yeah to just make it a profession or to gain more clarity about what is going on with my life and my health mm -hmm. and you know all this kind of stuff so just i wanted to just open a new door and the footnote program um yeah just offered this opportunity to me you know and to connect with like-minded people just like i said before and yeah just get the things going you know uh, without knowing um how this will turn right. out you know <laughs> Yeah. And now and we're sitting here. I think <laughs> and now we're sitting here. Yeah. I think the way that we do school right now is very uh, incongruent to how learning needs to be done in the future, right? Like there's mm. such a fast pace of information turnover where what's true today might not be true in, in a year, two years, five years. 
And so spending all this money doing a very unnatural form of learning where it's really what you're actually learning is how to get good at memorizing information. You're not actually understanding how to learn information, right? This whole realm yeah. of critical thinking and understanding how to get good at le- how to learn how to learn is pro I think is the most valuable skill for any human in today's age and moving forward. Because if the world completely switches on its head and, and you have to reinvent yourself every decade because of the pace of technology and how, you know, technology is going to take a lot of roles that humans currently do. And so you're going to have to shift. You're going to have to learn new skills. You're going to have to evolve your, you're going to have to grow. Learning, understanding how to learn is I think the most powerful asset for in a world that's constantly changing and making you reinvent itself. And so, you know, I think instead of isolation based learning, paying, you know, instead of paying a ton of money and doing four years of learning, why not have a community based program that allows us to constantly update the information, but also enables people to learn in a much more uh, intentional and pragmatic way so that, okay, instead of memorizing a whole textbook, you might read a couple chapters, but then the intention is for you to experience what you're learning is to apply that in your own life and, and be able to see, does this make sense to me? Does this, uh, do I feel this improves my health? I think that way of learning aligns much more with uh, how humans really learn optimally, right? As a community with support, um, without the expectation that you have to do this for this test, you're doing this because you should want to be learning this, right? You should, yeah, just out of interest, yeah. Out of interest. And, you know, learning about your health can always seem selfish initially, but anything you learn, you end up being able to teach and share with others. So, you know, learning about health is always a selfless, but also selfish act, which I think is beautiful because everyone can find purpose in improving their health and learning about health. And that's really what the community is about is like get a bunch of people from different backgrounds that are open-minded and figure out what the truth is with health and what works and what doesn't yeah. without having to think of, Oh, is this what was taught in school or, you know um, without having any egos of people trying to prove that their way is the best. It's, it's really a, a cool community that we can use to connect ourselves to people so that if you go to Australia, you're going to know people in Australia mm. It's in the community. And I think it's uh, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the FNP just um, offers a, a wider range. Um, I mean, one person gets the knowledge uh, through the FNP and can spread it uh, within the local community mm-hmm. and even further, you know, and that's what I wanted to achieve to bring the knowledge uh, right into Germany to make, I mean, in the future, you know, uh, seminars and workshops available in Germany right. and, you know, not every person has to join the FFP, you know, the Footnote program. But, you know, um, the people with the, uh, with the interest that grew from the inside out mm-hmm. can transfer this interest and this knowledge to other people from outside in. Right. You know, Ooh, that's a good analogy. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just, <laughs> just let it go. And because <laughs> we're kind of like nodes in this global network that can then be individual resources for our communities, like starting with even just our families, right? You can be a resource for your family, for your broader yeah. community, for your even broader community of something like Germany. And yeah. as long as one person that feels a deep sense of purpose with health is tapped into this collective brain that we all sort of are tapped into and are contributing knowledge to. Um, then that is really what allows us to ripple out into social networks with, you know, cause you affect even more people than your local community, because what you post on Instagram goes everywhere in the world. Heck, Zach Bush is getting inspired by the stuff you post. <laughs> <laughs> you had to mention this, right? <laughs> I had to mention it. It'll come up again when we talk about his video. Um, yeah, Zach Bush is just, um, a beauty of a human, of a human soul. And yeah, yeah, he's, um, an enriching factor for this world. So yeah, I, I agree. appreciate it. And um, yeah. I it's... appreciate Zach Bush is one of the, I think top five humans that I look to for sense making because yeah. the way he speaks, he has an insanely deep understanding. Like the guy's a, a, a genius in terms of his understanding of health. You know, if you want to talk Absolutely. about the most decorated, I don't really typically care about how, you know, what degrees people have, but no. This is one of the yeah, de- but- most dedicated f- physicians in terms of his, how many degrees he's got and, and how broad his knowledge is, you know, everything from, 
you know, really deep endocrinology understanding of hormonal balance and, and food to like soil health. This guy knows everything at both spectrums and everything in between. And, how, and more importantly, how it connects together with even spirituality and biology yeah, and mental health. Like it's, and yeah. listening to him is always very refreshing, but also very inspiring that there is hope for this, yeah, that's for, the, for, yeah. for us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's a source of hope to yeah. see people like him, humans like him in positions like he is in, you know, yeah. with all the certifications and degrees and, and this kind of stuff. Um, it's very important for, for humanity to see um, people like him in the roles that he just filled. And um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Powerful. All right. So we talked about the FMP. Let's talk about, um, well, let's talk about Beam Tribe because Beam Tribe, you are basically the forerunner and, and will be the leader of, of Beam Tribe. Um, and, you know, when people, uh, I always tell people that how I explain Beam Tribe has changed so much based on how it's, <laughs> how, how it's evolving and it's meandering. It's a work in progress, man. It's, it will never not be a work in progress. It, it is yeah. a perpetual work in progress. Um, but, you know, if someone asks you, what is Beam Tribe? What, what are you telling them these days? And I can let you, and I can Yesterday let you know. I would have said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just what it is. But like to you, what is, even aside, even if no one was asking you, what do you feel Beam Tribe is? And then I can kind of riff on what my current perception of Beam Tribe is and, and what I think, I think more important of what I think Beam Tribe is, is like, what problems does it solve? And I think that's a way easier one for me to answer. So let's start with yeah. you and then I'll chime in. Yeah, I will try a complete new way. <laughs> I like <laughs> <No>. it. <laughs> it's all experiments, um, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it relates to the story that I just told uh, right at the beginning. Um, you know, uh, I was so lonely, blah, 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 um, mm -hmm. in my community. And that's, the ex that's pretty much the exact thing um, Beam Tribe should be for, you know, to catch all the people um, so they can come together, connect, um, inspire each other, mm -hmm. share their health stories, you know, um, share their mindset shifts and, um, yeah, just get on track, um, for self-responsibility in terms of health, you know, all the stuff that we went through, um, and Beam Tribe should be, or will be, or is the community, the health community, um, people are looking for, you know? They are uh, the people that are going through the same stuff we went through, you know, of feeling lonely. Do I, uh, am I doing the right, the right stuff? You know, I want to listen to my gut. It feels so good to go naturally, um, you know, um, exploring the world with bare feet. It looks weird, but it feels so good. Um, mm -hmm. Where are the others? Right. There they are, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a so, great way of explaining it. Cause I, you know, I really think the whole concept of finding the others uh, and the concept of people coming, creating a container, right? Uh, designing a community that has a set of values. So it, it, it attracts a certain kind of person, a kind of person. And that's really why we created the credo, right? It attracts a mm. person who is open, who is willing to commit um, to a process, right? A lifelong process of just yeah, working on their health, work, focusing on learning and growing. It doesn't have to be at a rapid pace, but it has to be a deeply rooted value that I value health. Therefore, I want to learn and continue to progress and invest some of my daily energy into improving my understanding. And, you know, the information side was really the initial focus of Beam Tribe, right? Look, let's give people all the information they need to be healthy. That was like, and let's also provide like a really fun physical practice through uh, balance beam progressions and beam play so that people can actually enjoy a physical practice that not only works on their physical body, but also helps to improve their self-awareness, helps to improve their ability to focus their attention. Because like, I really think that our narrow attention span is a significantly bigger problem than what most people talk about because if you can't pay attention yeah. for more than like 40 seconds, which is the, I heard Tristan Harris talk about how 40 seconds is our average attention span. Now you can't read a book. 
you can't hold a conversation, a human conversation where you're listening. Uh, you can't participate in meaning, meaningful deep work because your, your mm. brain is always scattered. So, you know, I found I have a really weird brain that's really hard to harness. And so I found balance beam work forced me to sort of center myself and, and, and sort of be present. And it also had amazing physical side effects. Um, but, you know, that was the intention. Give the information, provide a fun system for people to use uh, to train their balance. But at a certain point, it shifted where it was like, this really isn't about the information. The information is, is great. The physical, the beam play progressions is great. This is really about finding the others and creating a container for people to help each other. And I really think yeah. it's just humans helping humans. And the Slack platform, I think, is going to be a really big boost because it's going to allow people to engage deeper with each other, regardless of where they're located on the planet. If you have an internet connection, you have a computer, you can connect with other people who share the mindset that they're not perfect with their health, but they're trying to get better every day. And we've created the content initially because we're sharing all the struggles that we've gone through, right? We invest probably way more energy than the average person trying to understand health and engage with our process. But eventually the goal is for everyone in Beam Tribe to be able to share their stories and to create content and to, and to it's just people helping people. And I think that whole community element of it has clarified what Beam Tribe is in my brain. It's like, it's a health community of people who align on a set of values and aims to provide all the information you need if you want to take personal responsibility for your experience. And, yeah. uh, and that's some powerful shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, health, it's, you know, to, to have health on the radar on a daily basis for improvement, it's, an, it's not a chore. You know, when you get really get into health, then you will see that health is the actual wealth of a human being. Mm -hmm. and that's why it's so necessary to have it on your radar on a daily basis and to strive for improvement you know because you just get richer with every day but right. not richer in terms of money and you know just the paper and you get richer on physical mental and on a spiritual level ultimately right. you know and so health is i mean you <laughs> is human wealth Yep. You know? and, yeah. You like, know, it's yeah. like every minute you're investing in your health, you're putting money into this piggy bank that money that it, stays. It's the most yeah. valuable form of wealth. I really think yeah. like you, 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 if you ask people that are very well off and wealthy, you know, I had a, a patient, one of the most significant patients I ever had was a uh, really high, high level lawyer. And she worked her entire life to build up enough monetary wealth so that you could travel. She loved going to India. She would go there for a month each year and connect with communities. It was, it was literally what drove her to work so hard was the fact that she could then eventually stop working and she could travel to India and spend more time there each year. Hmm. Um, and it was one of the most heartbreaking patients I ever had because she got to a point where she was neglecting her body so much through a lifetime of work, putting herself under massive amounts of stress by handling very big cases that paid her a lot of money, but required basically all of her life energy to be put into those cases and to her work. And she started having issues with her hip and started to get in a really bad place mentally because it was it, the first time it stopped her from traveling to India because she was having hip pain uh, was I think a really big hit to her mental state. Um, she ended up getting cancer, uh, and she actually ended up, uh, I believe, I believe she ended up passing away before she even was able to retire. And so she worked her entire life to be able to build enough monetary resources to do what she loved. And her work took so much of her life essence out of her that she was never even able to get to that point. And I think that story is all too common where people work for some ephemeral thing that they want to do. I want to retire and sit on a beach with a martini yeah. or whatever. Dude, yes. and, and they forget that they just spent 90% of their life's energy and, and yep. their experience working for some weird thing. And half of the time they don't even get there and they end up having to spend all the money they earned to get healthy so that they can do that stuff. And it's such a, a strange way of thinking where our cultural values have gotten really far off of, I think, yep. what it means to be a human. Yeah, and that's the story of a, of a conventional Western society life. Yeah. I mean, in Germany, you get into a pension um, at the age of, don't let me lie, 67. 
Okay. Um, or you have to at least work for 45 years after you are able, uh, before you are able to um, get a pension. Mm-hmm. So people work their asses their whole life and, um, you know, don't even think about health. When they have issues, they go to a doctor and they get an injection so the pain goes away. Two weeks after that, they, you know, the body breaks again. And, you know, when they arrive at the age of 65, when they're happy, um, you know, <laughs> they, they get to a full rest and then the body breaks. Right. You know, and, you know, I, life is over. Right. You know, when you work your, your entire life, um, don't even, you can't think about health because you just have to earn the money. You have to create the wealth um, to get the pension at 65. But at 65, you know, w- what do you want? Um, right. And when what's your body is, yeah, what's the point? And when your body is conditioned to, you know, stress the hell out the whole day and then the pension is there and you get to zero, you know, from 120% to zero, your body isn't able to handle that huge change. Right. You know, um, there was just a story. Um, he's, he has his pension right now. And now um, he has <laughs> his spine is, you know, done. Um, a huge, at the, at the vertebrae, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't have the term available right now. Um, these little pillows between the wood brace. Yep. The, um, uh, the discs. The discs, exactly. By um, the way, biggest... let's also mention that English is not your first language, which is insanely impressive because your, <laughs> your English is so good. Like my German is like three words. And <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so, German uh, isn't the, the world language. So English right. is a little bit more um, of a pressure to, to speak it. Right. nowadays um yeah but i'm i'm trying to do my best and you're doing great yeah so this guy's so, if, so there's a problem with his disc yeah yeah exactly um because of the, the just the massive change that i described you know from 120 to zero yeah and uh, in germany we say um wer rastet der rostet so it means when you get to rest um like metal you know, the, <laughs> there's another thing, the red, the oxidation. Yeah, the rust. Metal. The rust, exactly. Yeah. So when you rest, you rust. Hmm. I like you that saying. That's great. Yeah. And that's, that's so true. Just, uh, yeah. Your joints get rusty if you don't actually use them. And most people are spending their prime years of life working uh, and essentially rusting away because they're not actually moving. Hmm. Uh, you know, this whole... Sedentary lifestyle is the cultural norm. And that's a big problem because it doesn't align with our biology. And so if the norm is to do something your body's not meant to do, um, everyone is going to get broken down. And yep. it's almost, it's a really big problem because people normalize breaking down at even like 40 or 50, right? If everyone's breaking down, breaking down at 40 must be what our bodies do. And it's a really shitty story. And I think that story gets promoted by the medical community where it's like, Oh yeah, you're 50. You have osteoarthritis. That's just normal. It's like normal. We're not supposed to break down until we're like a hundred. <laughs> like you, you, yeah. you just didn't use your machine. You know, I always like to separate equipment fault, which is a problem with your body from a user fault, which is a problem with how you're using your body. Mm. And so many things that we assume are equipment faults, right. That we assume are flaws in the human biology are user faults that aren't even being mentioned as user faults, right? The medical community Mm. often says you have an equipment fault. I'll give you a short-term solution to troubleshoot that equipment fault. And we don't even talk about the fact that the user's not using their body for what it's supposed to be used for. So we're never going to solve these problems. And the more prevalent they become, the more it reinforces, see, this person has bad knees too. This person needs a knee replacement at 40. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't have to be that way. And until we change the mindset in the medical community, it's going to be really hard to change that sort of path. Right. Um, yeah. But and I think it's so it's hard to, yeah. And it's so hard to, to talk about, um, you know, experiences like this because you can't really say that it's their fault, you know, because we right. are threatened to fit into those frames, you know, right. We are, we are threatened to fit into the frame that we are, that we are breaking down with 40, you know, we don't know better. 
right. um, you have to have a lucky situation in your life where your mind um, suddenly expand um, into an area of okay maybe it can be different you know and yeah so there has to be there has to happen just a tremendous change in in the frames that we create or created yeah. um, for for human mankind pretty much and we have to stop reinforcing, you know, people with really expensive degrees have to stop reinforcing that false reality. Because I think that is even someone who's open minded, if they go to their doctor, and they get told the same old story, then it kind of reinforces like, oh, that's actually true. You know, so it's, mm. it's definitely tricky. Um, because the fault doesn't lie with the individual. If the use individuals never being told they have a user fault, then how would they know any different? Right. And if you go mm. into YouTube or the internet, you're just going to be confused even more because it's like a shit storm of bad information and it's really hard to filter out the good stuff. And, you know, that's really where the Footner program sort of originated from is like people who want to learn about this don't even have, you know, in a world of abundant information, information is actually not beneficial. Clarity is beneficial. Filtering through the 1% of information that's actually good and is relevant and is worth spending your attention on becomes really difficult. And if you can get a group of people that have found that 1%, right, that have found portions of that 1% individually, and they all contribute to kind of a, let's call it a, a database of information that is really potent and, and good quality, um, mm. that's where this collective wisdom um, I think really shows its strength where it's not, you know, the work that you're doing and the work I'm doing might be on different paths, but if you share what you're doing with me and I share what I'm doing with you, well, we've essentially been able to do double the work by just sharing our experience. And that's really what beam tribe is about. It's what the footner program is about. It's like, mm. just collect people who have cool experiences, share what we've learned and you can gain massive amounts of knowledge through just collaboration. And I, yeah. I think innately we are collaborative species. Yeah. And a deep desire, you know, to share their experience um, right. on how they promoted health for themselves. Um, you know, the medical world, it's, I don't know if it's about the deep desire to, to help people. Um, for me, it's, uh, it has a sense of just prestige, you know, um, who enters the medical world um, are those who have you know, the, the best A's, A plus in school. Mm -hmm. But just because you're good in school doesn't mean that you have a deep desire to help people um, with their health issues. Right. And it doesn't mean you're actually healthy enough yeah. to be able to, it, <laughs> to do that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's what I love about the FMP and, you know, the collective wisdom um, that comes together from, from a wide range of different humans that have similar or the same desire for health, you know, right. because they help themselves and they are open to helping um, their own health and to collect experience and the resulting wisdom to share um, with others, you know? Right. Yeah. And I think it's very powerful that we do have people from the medical community, you know, like there's an emergency room doctor, there's a pediatric radiologist. Absolutely. There are, there are doctors and physicians that are part of this community, which I think brings yeah. a beautiful perspective because they know what they were trained to do and they're open-minded enough to seeing, well, maybe there's an alternative in what I can learn to contribute to my own process. And I think that is super exciting to see people that are in the medical community have gone through essentially the programming of what medical school does yeah but i've and also been open-minded to be like i think there's more and yeah, that and is so refreshing in their lives yeah absolutely i mean and it's like just sec bush again you know right you have yeah, these, yeah. you have these people available find uh, the others <laughs> find the others you know um uh, we are not talking about 100 percent of the medical community right. we're just talking about this uh picture that um is building you know uh this is building itself in the in the uh, society, you know, yeah. um, they are there, you know? Yep. And I think just 
because we've been going for an hour we haven't even talked about fasting yet (laughs) so one last thing and then we'll get into sharing our fasting story and we'll do we'll do more of these podcasts because i think we could we could probably talk for four hours but i don't i don't know if uh people want to listen to us blab on for that long time Um, passes yeah yeah back to the thing that you're talking about where medical school selects for people who have the highest grades not necessarily for the people who are I think everyone that goes into medical school wants to help people, but not everyone that goes into medical school has a strong desire to continue learning and to really help others, right? They want to, I think they all do want to help others. They're just not given the right skill set. Yeah. But I mean, maybe we, we could just say it's a prestige to help others, but it's not a prestige to help others. Right. It should be a duty. Um, Yeah. Uh, uh, In a duty that, you know, flourishes out of your own self. Right. You know, but you're not by selecting people with high grades, you're selecting for traditional intelligence, right? IQ based Mm -hmm. intelligence. You're not selecting for emotional intelligence. And if you're helping other people, you need to be emotionally intelligent or else you're never going to actually help them. You're not selecting for people who feel a deep desire for health. You're selecting for people who want to be doctors. And by pricing, by selecting small groups, by charging insane amounts of money for medical school, because you know that they're going to make money. So you can just put them on the hook to be a slave, essentially, to pay back those mm-hmm. loans over a lifetime. You create an artificial scarcity where only a small number of people can be the people who help others. The yeah. weird thing is those people don't even have the, the understanding to truly help others. And so this artificial scarcity is where I think a lot of the problems are where Mm. We've lost the ability to just help others based on our experience. We think that you need to be a doctor in order to give advice. Mm. And what if the stuff the doctor's learning isn't even the right shit? It's like, no wonder we're in a situation where everyone's sick and feels shitty. We're not like the people who we're going to for advice are not being selected for. They're being made artificially scarce and they're not even given the right information. So it's really no surprise everyone's messed up. Yeah, exactly. Because it's the same way uh, in science. You know, you always have to be just objective um, without any emotion, emotional bond to the object that you observe. You know, it's the same thing. uh, Scientists go out into nature. Uh, They leave the emotion. They have to leave the emotions at home. And when you cut out the emotions, you don't have a human experience. So science is not human driven, you know medicine is not human driven right. all the, uh, when you when you add the emotions you just treat five patients per day and not 50 right. you know and and science is the same thing uh, you have to observe nature with emotions to get a real picture because that's the human picture you know all the sciences is not human science and that's why it doesn't work you know, right. that's why we fuck up nature with, yep. uh, with the science in the back, yep. because it's not human driven and humans can just be human driven. You know, it's, a, it's just a, too logical to just even talk about it any further. You know, <laughs> I know. I agree. <laughs> uh, it's so weird. We've, we, we just think we know everything. We think we know better than nature, but like it makes it, it's so arrogant to think yeah, that it's you just could arrogant. just separate the body into parts and think you're going to be able to actually fix the system by only touching that one part. Yeah, and because everything, everything becomes, becomes just a number. Right. You know, a patient is a number. And when scientists um, talk about a forest, they just, you know, collect numbers of animals, of, of, of trees, you know, and then the politicians decide with the science in the back okay uh, that many trees we can cut cut out but you you don't just cut out the tree you you kill a life you know because the tree and the animal it's all interconnected you you have right. to you you can't even measure the the immense amount of life that you just kill you know by locking up any trees you know trees are right. not just a number and that's when the emotions disappear you have this wrong decision making yeah, and, and the complexity of systems, even the human system, I don't think is anything we're going to fully, we don't need to fully grasp the complexity because we're never going to. There's so many variables. No. Um, you have to embrace 
the complexity of the system as something that doesn't need to be fully understood, but needs to be given what it needs to function optimally. Like our body mm. self-organized. This is one of the most powerful things with balance and walking even. They're not glorified in the world of strength conditioning or fitness or exercise, like walking or balancing on something. It's like, oh, that's kind of boring. Mm. That is the way that your body can express its innate intelligence to yeah. self-organize, to, to bring you back to a state where you are functioning efficiently without having to feel like you're telling your body how to function efficiently because it's way smarter than you. And you just have to yep. embrace that and use play as a way to essentially restore function without feeling like you have to control every part of that process. Because if you do, you're going to drive yourself crazy. You're probably going to fuck it up. And you can just trust your biology knows what to do if you just get out of its way. And it's not an approach that we take in, in sort of the Western world. It's we need to tell the body how to function well. Instead yeah. of let's just figure out what we're doing to mess the body up, take that stuff out and know that the biology will take care of itself. Um, speaking of biology, let's, let's talk about <laughs> fasting. <laughs> so uh, do you want to sort of set the stage of how this came about? Because you and me recently did a five day fast, um, mm -hmm. four, four days for me and five days for you. <laughs> um, and so let's maybe I'll let you set the stage of sort of how did this come about? Like, how did we come to even want to do a fast? How did the process go? And then let's talk and then we can kind of share our experience, maybe go day by day and, and express sort of the challenges we went through, things we learned. And even just talking about what is the value of fasting and what is fasting? Because I think a lot of people don't have a really good grasp of like, you know, certainly before Jeff put it on my radar, I thought fasting was something that people did for religious reasons. I had no concept of the okay. benefits of fasting, why mm. it was worth doing. Um, how potent it can be despite it being something that's not talked about mostly because it's free and because it doesn't align with this consumerist culture of buy more, eat more, all this kind of shit. So yeah, go through the story of how it came up and uh, then we can dig into kind of our experiences. Yeah. So first of all, um, I think my first uh, thoughts that I had about fasting were, you know, just to lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's just, you know, but I, when I think about what was my first thought about, yeah, but I realized that it's about gaining health and I mean, weight loss is another great topic we could uh, discuss. There's no, necess no necessity for weight loss right. in first place. Um, so yeah, uh, last time we mentioned Zegbush today, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he inspired us for, right. for me. And then yep. I got into um, connection with you about, and you joined. Um, yeah, it was just to create space for for a new thinking process and um, to hear the voice of the body. And yeah, it just sounded logical to me and worth doing. And that's why I joined uh, the five days of water fasting to you know listen to my body, yep. and he talked in a huge amount to me. Oh, yeah. dude. So you, you recommended to me a webinar that Zach Bush was going to do. So it was like an hour long yeah. chat. Um, so I signed up for it. It was free. And it was actually that webinar was actually recorded. And we've uh, uploaded it in TFC app. So if you search, if you go into TFC app, it's free. And if you search finding pause, it'll pull up the Zach Bush video. So if anyone wants to watch that, if you if you want to be inspired to give yourself a sense of purpose for why it's worth fasting, uh, watch that video. He also talks, he, I mean, he's a, a very, he's a triple cert board certified doctor. So he talks about at the end, some of the questions that people had about fasting, about different ways of fasting, contraindications, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first part is just gave context to, I think the biggest thing, like I knew the benefits of fasting. I knew it was good mm -hmm. for my body in terms of regenerative, uh, the regenerative function of getting rid of all the shitty cells, rene yeah. renewing sort of the digestive tract, giving it a chance to recover. But one of the things I never really thought of, and I think this was the most powerful driver to get me through sort of those four days, was he talked about how during this whole pandemic, um, there's a lot of people who are, who are going to struggle with access to food. There's a lot of people, mm. even in the United States, and this is something that I did, I had no idea of, that are already struggling to have to access food every day that are going to be even more hard done and are probably going to spend a lot of uncomfortable time being... Mm. Uh, unwillingly deprived of food. And what he said was, 
let's use this time. Let's use our own energy to connect and, and basically hold, like share space with the people who can't eat right now mm. and voluntarily embark on this challenge of fasting, even though we can't eat. And this is a big distinction, right? Starving means starvation is when you're involuntarily abstaining from food. Fasting is when you have access to food, but you're choosing not to eat it. And so embarking on this longer fast was a way to connect with people who are literally starving for a period of time uh, and to sort of essentially show that you can go through some discomfort and connect with people who are going through that same discomfort without un, like involuntarily. Um, and I think that was really powerful because every time I got hungry or felt something during those four days, I was like, there's other people going through this that don't even have access to food. And so I can definitely push through the discomfort or the mind games of wanting to eat, knowing that those people are doing this and they're not even trying to do it. And I think that was really powerful for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know about this, but um, yeah, sounds definitely right. And yeah. it builds a great um, attention for the experience itself. Yeah. Yeah. It put it in the context. And I wrote a little mm -hmm. thing put on, it in on the my, context. Yeah. I put a little note on, on my fridge. fridge that just yeah. said hold space for people who don't have access to food right now. And every time I felt like shit, I just read that, go for a walk. And then I was like, I just, I just got like, you know, NOS in cars where you're going really fast. You can eject the NOS. Is that, mm. is that a, yeah. So every time I read that, it was like NOS to be like, boom, I have a <laughs> renewed sense of energy <laughs> where it's like, I don't give a shit about food anymore. That, that just powered me up. Um, all right. So let's go through uh, the experience. So we did a water fast where, you know, I had one black coffee in the morning and then I drank water and that was it. Um, mm. And what, like, I had only fasted one time before this. It was for three days. Uh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff visited. He inspired me. I went through it. It was actually really tough the first time I did the three day fast. Yeah. And had you, so had you done fasting before and what was the longest fast you had done? Yeah, it was uh, the three day fasting okay. experience last year in 2019. Yep uh yeah with the fasting group around jeff the urban barefoot right. and i made it almost it was like i said two days and 20 hours or something cool. like that and it was and it was really tough it was super right. tough and the intention there back then was um to you know empty out the gut and renewal of the cells cool. and um yeah but this time was completely different um this time i did uh, the intermittent fasting um, in advance of the water fast and it was super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so the intermittent fasting, um, eight hours, eight hour window of fasting and then the six hour window from, from noon to 6 p.m. where I was eating like three gotcha. meals. Cool. Yeah, and it was really, really, really helpful. Um, so you to did... deal, especially with day one of the, of the water fast. So it was an 18 six. So you did 18 hours of no eating six hour yeah. uh, window where you're eating and you found yes. that helpful as For kind of a lead up. Yeah. And I mean, the, 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 the behind the scenes story of this is um, that you prepare your liver for this flex fuel capacity, you know, right. And to deal with the ketones and stuff like this, uh, because when you go for five days without eating, you try to, you know, clear out the storage that you, that you are keeping on the liver, you know, with the fat mm -hmm. and the toxins, you know, the liver is the, the filter for, for the bloodstream uh, with all the toxins that, you know, enter our body through water, air, food, mm -hmm. and, you know, they get um, kept at the liver and you can clear this space um, within a five day fast. Right. So it's almost like if you don't have new toxins coming in, the liver can focus on just pushing through all the shit that was getting clogged up. Um, and, you know, like there's so many, so many overused terms that become like trendy. Oh, I'm doing a cleanse or I'm doing a liver cleanse. And so it kind of loses its meaning. But when Zach Bush talked about the liver and the function it serves and the mm. benefit of a water fast to literally go in and allow some space so that your body can clean itself out instead of always having to deal with a burden of digesting food or clearing toxins. Um, that really made, it really resonated with me in a way that it, had, it never had before. He's just so good yeah. at explaining concepts in a simple way 
that makes it make sense. And yeah, and, you, yeah. you don't have to get the whole science. Um, no, it's not don't. necessary. You jo just dig right. into the experience and you will feel the science. You don't have to know it. Yes. You know, exactly. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I mean, I think, you know, every culture has ancestrally had a fasting practice. Like every culture mm. on the planet has done fasting in some way, whether it was part of a ceremony or a rite of passage. Uh, some religions do it, but you can fast for no religion reasons whatsoever. And I, I really think it's one of the most, it's one of the least talked about and most potent health practices you can do. And it always surprised me, like, why don't doctors recommend fasting? Why aren't we talking mm. more about fasting? And I think it has this, I really think that we've been conditioned to look at food in a very unnatural way where we have to eat totally. all the time. We have to eat yep. all throughout the day. And it's like this, it, it, there's no profit in fasting. You're, you're not eating food. And so no companies are making money from you. And I think that's a big part of why it doesn't get talked about, which is unfortunate because we've sort of lost this ancestral wisdom of how to reset our systems and develop and reset our relationship with food by just not by just essentially letting something fall off the boat of culture and and not really focusing on bringing that back um yeah and like i said you know uh, why do they not recommend fasting because fasting includes emotions right <laughs> you will experience emotions and, and discomfort um, and discomfort and stuff like this and uh, you know a doctor doesn't know how to handle this you know right and, and, and there's a fear of, and they didn't exp experience it at all right you know they so yeah it's just about emotions you know will you will experience your 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 inner self you know the emotions yeah. you will um get through the layers within the fasting experience and you know doctors won't recommend it to you <laughs> right exactly because they they don't learn about it. They probably yeah. have never experienced it. And so, exactly. and they don't understand the context of why it's so important. And this actually makes me think of a really interesting point. Like we have these projects with the Footner program, which are practical applications of knowledge so that you experience things. Mm -hmm. And the food project right now is to create a healthy, quick to prepare recipe for food. But I think the fasting project for food or the, the project for food should actually be to try your own fasting experiment, which can be however long you want, but I think, uh, I'm definitely going to put that in there for the October group and moving forward, because mm. I think fasting for me has been so eye opening to just feel things with my body that I, and, and to kind of sit with discomfort in a way that allows you to learn so much. And for someone yeah. who hasn't, most people won't have a template to really understand what that means because we live in a world that allows us for the first time ever to avoid discomfort ever right? You can not have to ever exercise vigorously. You cannot have to ever go without food. You can not have to ever go without a dopamine hit from looking at novelty. And so we've just like humans have become extremely soft because being comfortable yeah. all the time is now an option for the first time ever. And people yeah. often choose that and it's, it's messed up. Yeah. But the, I mean, the first question maybe would be, uh, why should I do this? Right. And the answer is because you're asking this question. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think having some information about the benefits is good, but it doesn't matter how many benefits you talk about with fasting, unless someone feels a really uh, is open minded to challenging themselves. Uh, it doesn't matter how many benefits you talk about, they're not going to give a shit. Uh, they have to yeah. really feel like this is something that they're comfortable challenging themselves with. And Jeff is great at building groups of people to support each other. And really that's what the Footner program is. Groups of people supporting each other on the learning journey, because at certain points it gets tough and at certain points you want to share or ask questions. And I think doing it together, like with Beam Tribe, I think we should create a channel in Slack that's a fasting group. So if anyone yes. wants to experiment with fasting, yes. we can coordinate so that every month there's a group of people who can help each other and talk to each other <laughs> yes. uh, nice about idea. fasting. Because I, I, I think that that's, part of the community effort with beam tribe is like find the others connect with them and embark on challenges knowing you have the strength of a group instead of just going alone because it's tough to go alone um yeah these conversations help a lot uh, when yes. you can engage in a conversation with someone um that shares you know this this type of um feelings yep uh it truly helps you know to engage with with people during a fast
Well, I know I wouldn't have been able to do four days if, if it wasn't for the knowledge that you were also doing it. And I think mm -hmm. one really cool thing with groups and when Jeff had that WhatsApp fasting group is like, it's easy to think that you are, are being uncomfortable alone or you're, not feel, you're feeling shitty things that no one else is. But then when other people are like, hey, I'm feeling this too. It's, it's actually way worse. Yeah. Uh, I almost puked. I felt really dizzy. You're like, oh shit, I'm actually doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just like knowing other people are going through it with you. It was, like, it was like the day that you're like, shit, I have a hard workout coming up. I have a body pump class that I'm putting on. And I was sort of like, screw it. I'm going to struggle with you. And I did like a really shitty hard workout. Um, <laughs> shitty, but awesome hard workout at home. And I, it was funny because I actually felt energized after it, even though I struggled really hard doing, I, I yeah, just went on the rowing machine and swung some kettlebells, but I was like, Felix is struggling. I'm going to struggle too. <laughs> yeah. It helps. It creates a purpose. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. And sort of so a bond. We, yeah, exactly. Um, so let's go through the days. Huh? Let's go through the days. So I took some notes. Um, so day one, uh, how was your day one? Um, day one was um, easy. Yep. Um, it wouldn't have been that easy if I uh, didn't um, went through the intermittent fasting because throughout these days, I broke the habit of eating mm -hmm. breakfast. And right. the first day of intermittent fasting was super long uh, until noon until I um, got into eating and then I realized, okay, I'm totally conditioned to having food available when I want it. Right. right. <laughs> you know, and that's why it was super helpful. So the day one was super easy. Um, no problems. Um, just a, a regular day for me. I yeah. wasn't hungry at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Easy. Me neither. Day one was super easy. No urges. I had no issues. I felt fine. I actually, I felt very uh, clear headed. Um, I usually only eat in a space of about four hours uh, in the evening. Like I only eat one meal a day, although I listened to a podcast the other day and I might experiment with having a little uh, meal earlier in the day just to, mm. I've been doing this for a long time and it might be nice to just experiment and see if I feel uh, any different, but yeah, day one was no issues. I felt I slept amazing the first night. And okay. it, made me, it made me realize that maybe I'm eating food uh, a bit later in the day, like I might yeah. eat around seven sometimes. Uh, and it made me realize that maybe I have to eat earlier because I slept amazing with no food. So anyway, that was just like a learning point for me. It's like, maybe I should make an earlier curfew for when I eat food because I slept really well the first night. So hmm. yeah, day one was easy. Let's talk about day two. How was day two? Yeah, day, day two was a different one. Uh, day two was my weakest day. Hmm. Um, you know, in the night, I was... Oops. Uh, oh, you're I'm good. back again. You're Sorry. Um, so day, day two was a uh, physical pain for me hmm. uh, in the limbs, you know, especially uh, under the, the forearm. And the calves, I had uh, a weird feeling of pain, like soreness. And hmm. um, yeah, it was tough. It was a super long day because I was so focused w into my body. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was like I'm looking into this world from a deeper level of uh, physical me. Hmm. Um, it was super weird. And the day was super long. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that's where I realized that um because we we spit our attention into this world uh, we have the idea that the years just are passing by because we are so we are so not close to our body anymore and when you get into a situation where you're very 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 close to your body uh you get a new feeling for time and 24 right. hours can be very long <laughs> I, I share that sentiment because it was it felt like days got longer and longer and i think it, it i mean theoretically you are creating more time right like i didn't have to go to yeah. the grocery store i didn't have to prepare food i wasn't actually spending mental energy thinking about what i was going to make for food so it actually created more time in my day which uh started getting hard to find ways to spend it when your <laughs> your brain starts like day two for me uh, I woke up, I had an amazing sleep after the first night, but then the time that I usually start eating in the evening, 
the mind games began. Around 4 p.m., mm -hmm. my brain was just habitually used to, now it's food time, what are you gonna eat, right? How are you, okay. gonna, how are you gonna harvest food? And I was like, it was a mental battle on day two, and I also felt very lethargic, like just low energy in the evening. So yeah, um, yeah I, had to, I had to read that little note on my fridge a few times on day two, because I was just like, my, but I must say though, and let's put a little asterisk here. I had a significantly easier fast than you because I live alone. I literally engineered my environment ahead of time. So I had zero food in the house because <laughs> I, <knew if> I, <laughs> I knew if I had some, it would be really tempting. Um, I purposely created activities that I would uh, fill my usual eating time with. So I had uh, walks. I had some reading that I wanted to do. I went out and did some slack lining. So I knew that I had to get out of the house on my usual eating time and distract my mind with other, not distract, but prioritize other activities that would kind of hold my attention. Otherwise the temptations would be very strong. Mm. You on the other hand, were preparing food for your family <laughs> yeah. were around people I mean, eating. That's impressive as shit. It. And I even en enhanced it. You know, I always uh, do breakfast. It's the end of my morning routine and I stayed with the morning routine on, on every morning. Uh, waking up between five and five thirty, and um, you know the morning routine were the morning routines were different uh, with with every day. Um, day two was really hard. Um, yeah, but I found a weird joy in preparing um, the meals. You know, I'm always doing breakfast. I stay with it, and when the family was eating, I was preparing lunch. You know, at eight a.m. in the morning. Right. And so that they are prepared with um, nice meals. And yeah, I just detected um, a joy. Uh, I got super creative. Um, I boiled quinoa. I boiled rice. I never thought that, that I have the time for boiling rice. It always takes 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> right. right. And, uh, you know, my wife usually prepared um, the lunch when I was working. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but the window was there and I didn't close it and, and it helped me, you know, and I think that, you know, gathering food and searching for food and preparing food, um, is an inner desire and for, for humans, you know, it's the complete experience, right? Eating is a part of our, um, experience that we have with, with food. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the reason why it was so helpful for me because I was part of this process you know I didn't had to to cut me out of the process and I just detected this inner desire um, this human desire to prepare food you know although I couldn't eat it right and yeah it made me a part of of the whole and you know my, my family appreciated um, that they had nice meals available. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy for me, you know, on the last day of the, of the, of the fasting experience, I baked cookies. <laughs> and <laughs> Dude, that's, so, that's some insane shit. That's like going cold exposure at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, but it helped a lot. It helped a lot. It, maybe it sounds weird, but dude, really, it's... No, I get it. I think I was uh, significantly more grateful at the fact that I have access to food whenever I want mm. during the hard times of the fast. Like I, I started to realize why well, I have, number one, I have behavioral triggers for food that are separate from the actual feeling of hunger because mm. at exactly the time that I usually eat at, uh, I knew that my body could go without food and was actually mm. doing a lot of good stuff to in the absence of food to, to, for health. But I also realized that I've basically conditioned myself through this one meal a day or one eating period per day I've conditioned myself to seek food at a certain time. Like the, the time on the clock is my signal for food, not my actual inner hunger. Okay. And so it made me kind of come to terms with that. And also maybe just really grateful for the opportunity to have food all the time, whenever I want, which I think uh, is something that's easy to take for granted. But during a fast, you really appreciate it. Hmm. Um, let's talk about day three. How was day three for you? Yeah, day three was better than day two. Um, you know, day two, I would say, was physical issue. Day three was the mental issue, especially um, because of the body pump class that I right. had at 6.30 p.m. So it pressured me the whole day uh, right. <laughs> if, I, if I'm able to do it. Um, you know, 
I used to don't have expectations, but in moments like this, uh, mm -hmm. also myself has expectations um, right. on its own powers. And yeah, so it was a really, really mental focused day, um, observing my physicality. And, but the pain was gone, you know, the feeling of soreness was gone. Um, mm -hmm. I was very happy about that because it was super annoying. <laughs> and yeah, it, it is. So, um, yeah, the legs were a little bit heavy. Yep. Um, you know, all this, the, the stairs were a chore. Um, mm -hmm. But it was okay. And, you know, as I went to the class, I was um, riding the bicycle and it was a good prep. Um, because I have to, I have this typical route and I were in the, in the same, um, what's the, the gears. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was riding in the, in the same gears like I usually do. So mm -hmm. it was a good prep where I'm at, you know, cool. and yeah, I just detected that you can tune on the machine when you want. Yep. And it made, made me super confident for, for the class and it turned out pretty good and mm -hmm. I felt amazing afterwards. Yeah. yeah, and I, uh, like I said, I knew you, you had messaged me. You're like, I got this body pump class tonight. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, nervous. Hopefully, I can get through it. And I was like, okay, well, screw this. I'm going to do a hard workout too. So bringing myself to do the workout was really hard. But actually, in the middle of it, uh, it felt amazing because mm. I was almost surprising myself that, wow, I'm actually capable of pushing my body pretty hard with zero food in my system. It kind of just it kind of took my brain away from the hunger a bit and also the whole time i was just thinking like felix is struggling right now you're you need to struggle too <laughs> and it was like allowed you me to push to. push harder yeah it was it was great and the only thing for me on day three um i definitely felt i felt like i had a like a 30 pound weight vest on me all day i was very mm. uh lethargic and had sort of low energy surprisingly the workout actually blasted my energy up where i went for mm. a really long walk after that uh because i just felt great but uh, on the third night, I remember I dreamed a lot about food. <laughs> okay. This was one yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, I also took the week off uh, cannabis, which I think was like a double, uh, a double thing because I knew that if I smoked, I would probably want food more. Um, mm. And usually I'll smoke a couple times during the week and taking the week off cannabis also just created a little bit more clarity. So I dreamed about food. Um, I always seem to dream more. Uh, when I, if I don't smoke, but I also, I also dreamed that I broke the fast. And so I woke up in a panic. I was like, no, I ate a bagel. And then I was like, wait a minute. No, that was a dream. And it was like, no, uh, it made me feel good. better when I realized it was a dream. So, um, but yeah, let's talk about day four. Yeah. But just because you mentioned the nights, the nights were always different for me. Like every night I had mm -hmm. uh, a long pee break mm -hmm. and, um, I was always in this, you know, uh, on a regular basis, I'm a little bit annoyed when I wake up in the night right. and, you know, I want to get into sleeping as soon as possible. But, you know, during the fast, I was in, in, a, in a state of alertness uh, mm -hmm. when I was waking up at night and, you know, I just tried to feel into my body. Uh, am I hungry or what's, you know, what's the deal? And, mm -hmm it wasn't really a problem to be awake. It was super weird. Uh, the state that I was in felt alert, not really tired, <laughs> but also not annoyed of being awake. Um, weird to explain. And I was always good to get up in the morning, you know, although I was probably had a waking hour for, you know, one and a half hours sometimes, mm -hmm. but it didn't disrupt my energy level. Interesting. That's which, like the, the main story of it. Which makes more, which does make sense, right? Like if you're, uh, if you were a tiger, for example, and you didn't have food, your body's keeping your energy levels high because you need to go and obtain food, right? If you mm. just go low energy, you're never going to actually get food. And you know, the, the tiger in the zoo that's always given food is the one laying down all day. Cause it doesn't actually have to be on high alert to access mm. food. It knows it's coming. Whereas a tiger that doesn't get food is on, it's in hunting mode. And I think I almost felt like I was in hunting mode during the week mm. where my body was trying to provide me energy and alertness to try and get food, um, mm. which I found very interesting. And I think that's where the improved mental clarity and focus comes from where, you know, what would typically be more focused aligned with trying to 
access food, you can then divert that focus to, um, you know, things that you do for, for work, for mm. example, or, or activities. Um, yeah. Day, day three that night I had a, you know, I woke up day four and it was really hard to wake up and I, I couldn't tell if it was the fast or the poor sleep that was affecting me more in day four, but day four for me was definitely, uh, the hardest where I felt, okay. I actually felt less mentally clear. Um, but like I said, I couldn't dissociate. I was like, am I just sluggish and foggy because I didn't sleep very well? Mm. Um, or is it because of the fast? And uh, how was day four for you? Yeah, day four was my, my absolute high. Uh, uh, it was pretty much the day with the feeling that I was waiting for. Um, you know, when you hit the wall and mm -hmm. when you get through the wall, you just feel amazing. And cool. that was my day four experience. Um, clarity mentally and physically hmm. um yeah I, I just can say that i felt amazing and cool. it was a state of feeling amazing that you have to experience you can't really describe it because right. you're out of food you didn't ate for you know four days how can you feel amazing right and but it's possible and it feels amazing <laughs> so um but you know ah uh, yeah and at that um typical point i was like oh i could do this for six seven days you know Amazing. because i felt this way but mm -hmm. during the day and the evening um you know it disappeared and the weakness came a little bit back back mm -hmm. but um the mental clarity stayed and i just had the realization okay day five will be great it will be the perfect timing to end the fast mm -hmm. you know i i envisioned the whole week um before the actual fasting experience and I just followed the path that I envisioned for myself mm. and everything turned out pretty exactly the way that I just you know wanted it to be amazing and yeah so day five um, was hard you know we had a conversation that helped a lot on our Friday call mm -hmm. and um, kept me on a, yeah because Day five, I really tried not to get angry uh, or to, you know, have a really bad mood. It was right. hard to, to yeah. stay on the lane. And then we had the conversation and it helped a lot because we, I, I mean, an hour or something like that just passed by. My wife picked me up. We drove uh, to Jena, you know, to the, the restaurant that I was desiring to go. Nice. Uh, with the miso soup nice. and so 6 p.m on friday it was done and amazing and you know the biggest observation physically in this week was my heartbeat that i was very very close to my heart um i almost felt it the entire week wow and I felt that my whole blood was really centered uh, in the inner intestines mm -hmm. and my, my, my limbs, they fell asleep very quick. You know, when you're in certain positions, like um, having pressure on your hands and you're laying a little bit back, mm -hmm. um, you're, you get this feeling of, okay, uh, they fell asleep, you know, when the, 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 the blood flow is restricted. Yeah. And it, I got super, super fast into a situation where this feeling appeared. And that's what I realized that all the blood was really centered in my body and the limbs were, you know, there wasn't that much blood over the whole week. And mm -hmm. I couldn't extend or had this feeling for hip extension while walking like I usually do. You know, I couldn't channel, channel the hip extension while walking. And as soon as I um, ended the fast with the eating, I, I stood up and checked it and it was there again. You know? Wow. I, I felt that, that all the blood flow just streamed out back into the limbs and I didn't felt my heartbeat that much. Hmm. I was so close to my heartbeat. It was beautifully weird. <laughs> And, that's very yeah. interesting and I, I so my biggest things I felt I had a lot of uh, 
called orthostatic hypotension. So when you, you get lightheaded after being in a position for a period of time. So I think okay. probably a similar mechanism to you because I never usually get that. And I remember taking notes, uh, you know, my, in my daily, in the journal I do before I go to bed every day, that was a really powerful one where I'm feeling mm. lightheaded way more frequently. And I always sort yeah. of, I never really thought about it like you did, but I think it makes sense to think most of my blood is, is, being sent to my inner area to do the work of yeah. sort of recycling those tissues, getting rid of damaged tissues. And like maybe a lot of the blood was going to the liver to sort of engage in the yeah. process of cleaning itself through, but Eating. that was yeah. one note. And then, uh, yeah. in the evening on day four, um, is when I broke it, uh, because I knew I had a big day on Friday in terms of calls and work that I had to get done. Um, okay. Yeah. And I was almost, I was causing myself uh, stress, which I, I kind of thought would disrupt my sleep. I was worried that I would have another shitty sleep. And if I woke up in the same state of fogginess on Friday as I did on Thursday, it was going to cause me a lot of stress because I wouldn't be able to put in the work I needed to, to do, the deep thinking I needed to do on certain things that I, I had to work on that day. So mm -hmm. I had an avocado. Um, I still kept it light. I had one avocado with some lime juice and, and a handful of almonds. And I found that that made me sleep amazing. I felt great on Friday. I didn't eat anything on Friday until Friday evening. And my brother and his girlfriend actually did this fast with me. They had never done a fast before. And mm -hmm. they did, uh, my brother's girlfriend did four days. So she broke it the same evening I did. And my brother went five days like a friggin' savage. And was like, yeah, he's a I, was like, I was like, dude. <laughs> so we had some uh, carrot and ginger soup and then a salad. So we kept it light. And I think keeping the meal light when you break a fast is very... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's good um, yeah i had the same intention but uh it turned out to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah i ended up crushing a lot of the salad like but the food tasted so good oh my goodness yeah. that avocado and almonds that i had were like this tastes like it's candy how is this nature um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah for me it was just learning that like i you learn a lot. You learn a lot about your behavioral habits with food, your relationship with food, the fact that you can do something that you were like, I was a little bit like when you call, when we talked uh, the weekend before, I think it was Friday, you're like, Hey, I'm doing a five day water fast. You want to do it? And I was like, Oh shit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was you like, spontaneous. I was, I was just like, okay, yes, this is going to be scared. I was a bit scared and nervous. I was like, the three day one was tough. I've never done five, but it went really well. And I want to do a, a five day before the end of the year and not have that little asterisk of the avocado and almonds. But I think I'm better prepared now with an understanding that I can do this. I know the things to troubleshoot. Uh, I can, I have an initial batch of data that I can compare data from my next fast on, which I think will be kind of cool. See how my body reacts differently or how my brain reacts differently. Um, so yeah, man, overall it was, thank you so much for suggesting it, for sending the Zach Bush webinar, because it was a, it was a super powerful experience. And I think it's, yeah. um, you know, I, I hope that our chat has, will maybe inspire. I mean, first of all, I encourage everyone to do their own research when it comes to fasting, right? There are some contraindications, people that shouldn't do extended fasts. Uh, yeah, it's not very medication or something like that. You have definitely have medication, to check a mother who's pregnant. So there are, yeah. you know, Jason Fung has a great book, which is a complete guide to fasting. Uh, it's an, it's a really good book. He covers a lot of the contraindications that Zach Bush video is very inspiring. And also he talks about, um, some tips and pointers for fasting. So I encourage everyone to do their own research, but I also encourage everyone, you know, I watched that Zach Bush video with my mom at dinner. And my mom's been doing 24 hour fast and my mom was the last person I would expect to embark on this. And so it's really, you know, I think us doing five days show if we did a 24 hour fast, she probably wouldn't do it, but we did five days. Mm -hmm. So she was like, well, if they can do five days, I can do one day. And she's actually really enjoying it. And, and she feels more clear headed. I spoke to her, I speak to her every morning at 6:45, and I've kind of been asking her how they've been going. And uh, so it's really cool to see. I never told her she should fast. I just, shared with her what I was going through and why I was doing it. And she automatically gravitated to wanting to do a little experiment herself, which is a lesson for me that I need to try and push information on people less and simply just share what I'm doing and the reasons why I'm doing it. And it seems like automatically people gravitate to wanting to try something when it's not forced on them. And, um, yep. absolutely. My, my parents did an intermittent fasting week after my face, uh, after Amazing. my fasting. Nice. Uh, intermittent fasting. I didn't, I don't know if I say feast. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I, <laughs> Feasting was on your mind. 
<laughs> so yeah, they they were inspired as well. Um, I cool. didn't threaten them to do it. Um, <laughs> it was all on their own, and yeah, it was amazing. They felt good. They never did it. Uh, they never did it before, but they will do it again. So amazing. it has an it had an impact on them, and yeah, it's always good. I mean, the main goal can just be uh, breaking habits. You know. Yep. That's totally and enough. Challenging yourself and showing event. yourself. Yeah. And just showing yourself that like your body's capable of shit you don't know it's capable of. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it fits really well in line. I've been in a couple conversations I've had recently. It's just talking about health by subtraction. We love adding stuff like add this mobility exercise, add this drug, add this thing to get mm -hmm. healthy. Whereas, you know, health by subtraction is a really uh, beautiful way of simplifying health, right? health comes foot health comes by subtracting footwear or subtracting the stuff that you typically have in footwear it comes by subtracting furniture because then you're forced to explore your body it comes by subtracting food not focusing on what foods you need to add but spending doing an experiment and seeing how your body handles not having food for a certain period of time so health by subtraction is this concept that i keep thinking of and makes so much sense and is essentially a way to trust your biology that it will figure it out Take away the things that cause us problems. Your body will know what to do to figure out a solution to the problems uh, that come up by subtracting away the unnatural stuff that we do. So, um, yep. yeah, man, thank you for, dude, how do we chat for an hour and 45 minutes? It, it, it seems, I think this happens when I, when I do podcasts with people that I speak to <laughs> regularly, where we chat for an hour a couple of times a week. So uh, it's crazy to think that it was an hour and 45 minutes, but Hopefully yeah. some people are still listening by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, dude, thank you for taking the time uh, out of your day to do this. Thank you for suggesting the fast and going along the journey and inspiring me. You are a huge inspiration to me because every time I started to almost doubt myself or feel the struggle, I knew that you were going through it and my brother was going through it. You know, I would message my brother every day and his girlfriend and say, how you guys doing? You know, when they were struggling, I was struggling. And I think it reinforced the fact that Community is one of the most powerful uh, ways to gain strength when you're going through a challenge, like in a yeah, massive way. I always underestimate that. I don't know why I should just know that that is a potent element, but you know, whether yeah. it's a footnote program or beam tribe or finding people to embark on a challenge with you. Um, I think it's really powerful and I'm grateful that you mentioned it. So um, yeah, any, thanks any, for joining. Ah, no worries, man. I look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Any closing remarks before we wrap this up? Um, anything, any take homes about the fast or just, uh, you know, about things in general? Um, take homes, um, jump right into the weaknesses that appear right in front of you or within you. Um, it's the only way you will regain the control you were never asked for, you know, to, to, um, to get away. And um, yeah, man, humans are stronger than, than most of the humans might think. And yeah. the only thing to experience this or to believe it yourself is to, to try and explore it. And yeah, man, be your, be your guide, you know? Yeah. And just rely on how you feel instead of always needing external people or external gadgets to tell you how you feel. Just sit with discomfort and hopefully yeah. this um, podcast inspired people to sort of do their own research, embark on their own fasting challenge, which can, which can start with something as simple as just skip breakfast one day and see how you feel. And uh, I think it's a really powerful tool that we don't talk about enough. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed that uh, and we'll catch you next week.